Thank you very much. So I imagine the other panelists will also have microphone, yes? Right? Okay, she's not listening to me. Or someone will be able to answer that? Uh, engineers? Sure. The other panelists will have microphones or they will? Okay. You got it. Yeah. All right, sorry. My name is UN, uh, United Nations UN, in case you want to ask questions, whichever. Uh, Slido is up there, so we will be referring to that shortly. And we'll have our panelists bring them up on the stage right now. Uh, we have Abhishek Jain, Head of Product of Faith. Maxine Ebroga, UX designer of Picture Chart. Irene Fu, VP of Marketing, Photobook Worldwide. Awesome. Okay, so. The idea of this session, they call it the panel session, but that the name is uh, Fire Drill. So we want to do this very efficiently. We ask some questions, they answer very quickly, and we'll take that from you. Also, so participatory is very important. Please slide as much as you can so we can look at this and ask some questions immediately. Okay, just to get everyone to the right context and while they are coming in and sitting down and picking their places, the right context is, first, talk about your, your, your company. Oh, you don't have a mic. Jeez. Okay, we'll share that. No, we'll just have to share two mic with three persons. Um, first, you talk about you, your company, very quickly, and also perhaps give us an idea of the size of your company, whether it is revenue, whether it is the kind of visitations you get on your site, um, so something like that. What's up, Abhishek? Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Abhishek. I'm head of product at Fave. I've been uh, in the product space for around six plus years, but I started off as an engineer and moved on into product uh, over the last few years. About Fave, uh, we are a rewards and loyalty platform for both customers and merchants. Uh, so on one hand, we have customers who buy deals and use cashless payment on our platform, and on the other hand, we have merchants who use our platform to grow their business. In terms of size, uh, we, have, we are doing a run rate of around 100 million this year. We have 15,000 plus locations uh, using our platform. And in terms of number of customers, we get around, I think around 6 million plus transactions a year. A year? Six, uh, 6 million six a year. 6 million transactions a year. Yeah. Okay, let's find out if we have some of the 6 millions in this room. Anyone use faith? Okay, I'll say about 33.8% of this room use faith. New customers to acquire. Yes, the rest will be your, your new customers to acquire. Okay, Maxine, let's hear it from you. Hi, I'm Maxine Abrogar. I hail from Manila, Philippines. My background is in product management also in UX design. It was a hybrid role, but I transitioned into full-time UX there about 2015. Um, so I work with Pick the Chart. Our company is an online design tool that helps people who cannot design actually become great designers. And to date, we have around 10 million plus, there are about 10 million plus subscribers. Um, 20, around 26,000 of those are paid subscribers and the rest would be your free subscribers. 26,000 paid subscribers. So there's a certain stage when you have to pay otherwise. Yes. Simple stuff, it's quite yes. doable by the machine. So you can use the tool for free, but if you want the additional features, then you can subscribe to become so a pro. So who would man. usually subscribe to what you do? Um, paid subscribers would mostly be marketing people. So they're corporates as well as smaller companies? Both. Right. So our tool right now is catering consumer to consumer. So right. it's not enterprise. Right. So yeah. it's usually enterprise. Yeah. Okay, a quick check around the room as well. Anyone a picto chart user here? Awesome. You're using everything, right? Before you come, you click on I must use everything. Try first. Okay, anyone else? Decide. Alamak, decide. Okay, decide you all must acquire, okay? There's only one user there. All right, Irene. Hi. Um, good morning. <laughs> so I'm Irene. I'm the VP of Marketing for Photobook Worldwide. Um, just to share with you guys, if you don't know us, so we are our headquarters is based in Bangsa South, but we are actually a worldwide company. We have um, offices in Australia, Philippines. Um, and Canada, and we are really growing extremely fast. We're one of the fastest growing, uh, in a way, a standalone e-commerce company. Um, 
we have actually um, uh, okay. Wait, before that, so basically we have two. Platforms. So you have to qualify. Have to qualify a little. Bit. <laughs> you you no. You have to also qualify. You are the biggest. Okay, we, qualify yeah, that. The biggest. <laughs> Cannot just All claim right. biggest, largest, fastest, but what? Okay, so we 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 actually do two. Uh, we do have two platforms. So one is on a web and one is on an app. So when we launched our app in January 2017, um, at the current moment, we have 1.2 million downloads. So it's actually really, really fast in within 1 a, wow. uh, mm. in a one year span. Mm. Um, we've actually hit, um, our f almost hitting our 4 million orders. Uh, we've been around for 13 years. Um, and with 4 million, four million in orders. orders. Yeah, as in we ship out 4 million products. Almost 4 million products in a way. Um, with what else? Homegrown, well done. <laughs> Who? Photobooker? Do you call them that? Sayu, Sayu, oh, I no, use a lot No of one knows Photobook. No, but, um, yeah, you see? Thank you so much for testing all products, okay? Wonderful. People should be like that. Okay, awesome. So now let's talk to let's talk about what's really important. Uh, incredible customer experience. You guys are not offline. You guys mostly are online. So when it's online, you know, it's completely different, wouldn't it? So what we want to know first is the kind of what sort of what what do you do to first recruit customers online? What kind of platform you're using? Um, how do you do it? Can you please be very specific and name us? the kind of offers that you usually um, put out so that you know this is sticky, this is not, this doesn't work for us. Be clear about that so that we can all make sure that it's a learning experience as well. Yeah, I appreciate it. Right. So in our case, we have, uh, like I said earlier, we have cust our customers are merchants or restaurant owners, spa owners on one side, and people like us on the other side. So principally, we go wherever our customers are, right? So what I mean by that is, say if it's a deal purchase, so we say we go through channels like uh, Google, Facebook, the usual ones, Instagram also for that matter. But for FavePay, which is an offline first product where you scan and you pay it, your bill, we go, we work very uh, actively offline. Meaning uh, we have promoters who, who educate customers about the product and get the, help them use it for the first time. We get help from our partners, right, which is restaurants, uh, retail stores, mm. right, to educate customers about the product because they see a lot of value in it, right. For businesses, it's right now it's primarily via our salespeople, right. We, uh, we don't do online marketing for our businesses right now. For our customers, we do a lot. So you don't do, sorry, repeat, you don't do online marketing to recruit customers? Uh, we do online marketing for deal customers, but off, a lot of offline marketing for pay customer, which is you cashless payment. So you scan and you pay. So you have promoters account. walking around and doing we it. Have, we so have do you have a specific strategy in doing that? Uh, we choose places uh, where we believe. Uh, from our point of view, we see there's a lot of potential of growth, and how convenient the user finds uh, the customer finds it. And uh, so yeah. So customers that are not paying online, then you recruit those people in, with the interest to turn them into paid customers yes. uh, in the future. So how how do you recruit those people? Uh, where do you go and recruit those people? What sort of what sort of stuff do you do? What sort of campaign so we, do you drive? So there are two, right? There's paid and uh, organic. So we do invest a lot on organic traffic as well. So we in, our team invests a lot on how do we increase the SEO traffic to our platform. So that's free. Uh, that's one way of acquiring customers. A large part of our customers actually come from there now. Uh, the other is paid campaigns. So we use all possible channels except LinkedIn. Uh, but affiliate networks, why we work with platforms like Carousel, Lazada, Tokopedia to acquire customers. So that's affiliate marketing. Uh, performance campaign is on Facebook, Google, and link, uh, Instagram. So how much effort do you put into each one? I mean, just very specific so that we understand. In terms of like, okay, these are priority, this is not. And if we have to spend, where do I spend it? Uh, I think a lot, I'm, I'm not the right person, honestly, to answer the question because it's a very marketing first question. Uh, but we spend uh, a lot on Facebook. Because that, that's where the, you have users who are engaged, right? For Google, it's more SEO first because the user has already shown his intent in what he wants to buy, right? So we make sure that we show up in top few results in Google for that. So paid is more uh, Facebook and organic is more Google. Can I just ask a, you know, just test question. <laughs> Do you know what is your yearly marketing budget? No. What? <laughs> but you're a product head. You should know how much the marketing people are spending your money that you got so in. It varies from, uh, to, uh, honestly, okay. Uh, it varies from month to month and country to country. Okay. Uh, but it, it's pretty huge, is all I can tell you right now. 
and B is because it's huge, therefore you can't tell me. Uh, it's it's in the order of a million, more more than a million. Sure, it has to be, but I have to hear it from you. But okay, <laughs> Irene. Yes. Similar vein. You know the kind of question I will be asking. Okay, tell us. All right. So, um, for us, user acquisition basically comes from our free books. So we give out a lot, a lot of free photo books. I think most of you who have actually heard of us would have heard of us because of a free photo book. Wow. So yeah. to get four million, how many do you have to give out? Oh, we've been giving out a lot of free photo books. How many right. millions? Is that um, is that double, triple? Do you want a specific number? I do. I can't give you a specific number. Right? Don't you think numbers are important? Yeah. So <laughs> I right. like. So we have been. So out of the four million. Almost half of it is free books. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we've been. Uh, so our user acquisition has always been free books. We started off um, not using Facebook or Google, but we started off using partnerships. So by actually reaching out to different partners, different brands, and then reaching out to their database, right? By giving out free for the books, free for our prints, right? Basically, that's where you actually attract um, people to come on board and try what for the book is all about. Um, after a while, we noticed that, yes, uh, we got to start doing a little bit of paid marketing, right? So we started off with Facebook, we started off with Google. Um, we primarily use Facebook. Uh, one of the reasons why is because we are actually a very visual company. For you to actually be really, really enticed of what do you want to buy from us, uh, like, for example, we sell photo book, um, hence the name photo book, but we also do sell... Um, photo gifts, personalized photo gifts. So basically, those are the things that we actually have to show on visual. So Facebook has been pretty much one of the best channels that we have um, via for uh, whether is it revenue, whether is it for user acquisition, whether is it for um, you know downloads of our app as well. We do um, Google, uh, not that much, but yes, here and there, all right. Um, but primary, yeah, Facebook. That's the biggest one. Um, okay, I know she's gonna ask me what's my budget. <laughs> yes. Okay, that's the question. Yes, <laughs> but, but it's important for a lot of people to understand what is the minimum Facebook budget, you know, that we should be allocating. Is one thousand a day enough? Okay, I, I won't tell you my budget. That's actually very hard for me to share with you. But what I'll share is basically we look at CPA. We are a very ROI based company. Okay, so um, what is your CPA? So averagely, our CPA cost is almost five ringgit. Five so ringgit per per customer per acquisition. Yes, five ringgit. For photo book, the model is five ringgit per customer. Uh, that's that's the benchmark, but it really depends on the market segments you are in. You can be in Malaysia. So for us, because we are worldwide, um, every country actually differs. Uh, but if you're saying Malaysia, yeah, averagely our CPA cost is about five bucks. Okay, let's talk about user experience proper um, online. When you are, you know, how, how do you decide what you decide on when you? When well, you build the UX? Well, first, you, you need to know who you're designing for, right? So, like for Picture Chart, we have 10 million plus users, and it's a matter of working hand in hand with the product manager. Who do we want to target first? So, would it be the cohort of marketing people, marketing communications people, PR people, or are we gonna go and design for people who are in the education sector or in the NGO sector? And from there, you look at the product and what are the current or the platform, the design, and you look at what are the problems that the, these types of users seem to be having. Like when you look at the quantitative data, at which point of the screen do they turn or do they fall off? Um, which part of the design do they seem to keep doing rage clicks on? Like they keep clicking on this for whatever reason. Um, which part of the product seems confusing to them because they want to achieve something, but then they're clicking on this, this area of the design. So for UX design, again, it's more of really looking at the design itself or looking at the product from the lens of design and seeing, okay, what of the design is helping users achieve what they want to achieve and what of the design is keeping the users from achieving what they intended to do in the first place? Uh, I think the, uh, the, the right question is not how much do you spend, right? Because I could spend a billion dollar if I can make my money back, right? And how long of, how much time do I, can I afford to make that money back, which is the customer lifetime value, right? So I could spend uh, $1,000, right, if I can afford, if I have the budget in the first place, and can I recover that money or not, which is what she was talking about, the ROI of the, from the customer. If I can, then you can go crazy, but if you can't, Right, then you have to be very frugal in terms of when do you, how much do you spend, where do you spend, 
in, at any point in time, you have to be very efficient in which channel you use, and within that channel also, which campaign is giving you the ROI that you need. So it's a, it's a very iterative process to get it right. But so you ask this question when we are going on a separate flow to come back on your question that you couldn't answer in the first <laughs> round. I appreciate it. My faith, yo. Okay. <laughs> you want sorry, I'm not I, sorry, I hope correct. I did answer. No, no, your no, question, you know right? you're absolutely correct. Just don't break her flow. Don't break her mojo. Oh, I'm sure Abishak we'll had We'll come good, back to you. We'll come had back good to intentions. That. You will have your chance to say your piece, don't worry. Yeah. Uh, so so back to you, right? So my question to you really is um uh, then how how often will this design change? Uh, oh, are you all the time? Yes. Is that disturbing to a, a, a consumer that's coming it, on site all the time? It's very iterative, just like what Abhishek was saying. Design is very iterative. Changes happen every week. Um, we have goals every weekend. Okay, what are we going to roll out in terms of change? But the change doesn't have to be big. The change is always incremental, very small. Sometimes the change wouldn't even be recognized by the user unless you actually make the user aware that there is a change. So how do you do that? You have pop-ups in the design, you have onboarding, you have, with the help of the marketing, um, because marketing knows the usual user journey of how the user from, let's say, a digital touch point, let's say Facebook, all the way to the product, what the flow is, and say you're gonna launch a new feature, a change in the design. So in tandem with marketing, they help educate users of the change. Um, so yeah, so change is every week. Well, change is every day, but in every terms of rolling out the change, every week, every six, yes, somewhere between six weeks, there has got to be a change rolled out. Whoa. Yeah. I mean, most companies, especially the smaller ones, will not be imagining that you will have a UX designer sitting in your office. You will probably just go to a, I mean, you outsource uh, once to do your website and, and finito, right? You're not gonna look at it every six weeks and say, what sort of change? And obviously you make your changes based on some data that's been collected and, and how they look at the site and stuff like that. So what do you say to companies who don't have a UX designer sitting in the office? Well, number one is hire a UX designer. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm but, sure um, they're not cheap. Um, well, uh, if you're a we need to be cost tech efficient. if you're a tech first company, if you're a digital sure, sure. product, um, sure. I would really suggest that yeah, yeah, hire yeah. someone who does UX or UI. Um, but if not, then if you're really starting out, the first thing that you can, and I'm sorry, if you're really starting out and you can't afford, the first thing that you can ask yourself is, um, okay, who are my users? And if I put myself in the shoes of the users, what is it exactly that they need? Um, and you try to break down your product or your digital product, let's say per page. For this particular page, when I, if I'm, let's say, a first time user who will encounter this page again for the first time, what will they need? And then maybe you can start with that um, and design the page according to what you know or what you intuit your user's need will be. So that can be a first step. Mm. Yeah, but okay. um, again, with UX, it's both you have quantitative data, but at the same time, if you're a UX designer, you have your whole experience bringing, you bring with you to the table so that even without the quantitative data, you see the design and you know certain things that are wrong. Um, and you have also, again, your years of experience with actual users to give you intuition as to what they would need in terms of this design. Okay, and Abhishek, in terms of um, how you look at your product, and how do you, just, just to tie back into what Maxine was saying, right? In terms of UX, how much of what you design or what your product, how you come up with the way you are doing, uh, managing your product, uh, innovation design, how much of that do you work with the UX team or the online? Oh, very closely actually, because they are our ears to the user basically, right? Our, our research team or UX research team actually goes out a lot talking to user in person. Right. So that's why we get the qualitative data that we need. So that's one source of data point for us. Right. The other is quantitative data. We have enough tracking set up in the app or on our website to know what's working, what's not working. Or where's the bottleneck? Right. So, so what are the key questions you ask online? Like uh, what are the metrics that you're looking at that's important for you after so many months of experience? So metrics-wise, we, we look at two different kinds of metrics. One is the output metric, right, which is the DAU over MAU ratio, which gives you a sense of the retention of the platform. Right. Uh, we look at rating, we look at reviews, they're all output numbers. 
input wise, what we look at is uh, the acquisition rate. Mm. Right? Are we acquiring enough new customers or not? What and is your benchmark? Uh, that it's a rate. It has to grow every month, 30%, right, 40%. Right. So it's a growth right. that you're yeah, looking it's a at growth rate. Person, it has to right. grow month on month. Teams have our, our, my team has KPIs to hit a number. Mm. Uh, so once you acquire, do you, are you activating enough customers or not? Right? Meaning, do they make the first transaction or not? So that's a separate metric. Third is retention. Right? So people who buy, do they come back and buy next month or not, the month after? So we look at cohorts of month on month, because every time we release a change, we look at cohorts of what is the retention rate, what is the activation rate now. So these are the input metrics that we look at. We look at things like, uh, say, if, uh, what is the average order value? Right? Is it going up or down? If it's going down, we need, to, we need to figure out why is it going down, who is it, for which set of segment of customers is it going down, and who are these people? So talk to them again, which is where the research team comes in sends out a survey or does a face-to-face -face, uh, interaction with the customer to find out more. So I'm interested in how you assign your teammate to specific KPI. So for example, we talk about um, activation um, of uh, customers. Um, the moment that they are recruited and then they're not activated within, say, your benchmark time, let's imagine that it is in 24 hours, yep. what do you do? Like, what does the person do? Uh, is that how it works? Then you, they need to make sure that they do something so that this client is actually activated. So this is where our CRM team steps in. So we have a user journey built, which is where we expect you to do certain things in, certain time, in, in a certain amount of time. If you don't do it, we start educating you about that feature, right? The last step is when we give you an incentive, which is in the form of a promo code or an additional discount to make the transaction happen. These are our emails. Uh, email and push port, or in-app as well. So you might open the app multiple times, but you might not buy. So there is enough uh, communication in the app is also to make you buy. Interesting. And this sit under product. What does marketing do? So marketing helps us acquire more customers. Uh, performance so they marketing. only acquire? Yes. And then after that, product will take over in terms of uh, retention, in terms of activation. Yes. Converting awesome. this guy, making sure he comes back, buys again and again power users, creating more power users, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of activation, Irene, um, what kind of metrics are you looking at? All right, so Photobook has a different structure, slightly mm. different from how Faith works. Um, mm. CRM, retention, everything actually parks under marketing itself. So what um, Abhishek has actually mentioned, yes, um, in terms of uh, activation, uh, in terms of re even retention of um, our customer base, we actually do use a lot of CRM. Um, we do a lot of in-app pushes, we do a lot of pushes. Uh, I think some of you who have actually downloaded our app, you will see tons and tons of pushes from us. Um, we, similar, do have a user journey. So if a customer has actually first, um, say, first subscribed or first bought a particular product, um, there's actually a user journey to kind of give them a different kind of um, uh, journey. So it can be a different product that you buy, or it can be a smaller item that you buy, or even if it comes from a free book that you actually bought, right? Um, the journey differs from every customer as well. So what we do is, um, via retention base, we also do a lot of upselling. Um, we do a lot of um, getting customers, understanding customers, uh, what would they buy next, what are the products that they would um, can't move away from. Like for example, if they were to first buy a photo book, what will be the next product that they will buy? So there's a lot of research behind that as well, understanding who our customer base surveys. Um, we also do a lot of um, you know, customer net promoter scores to even see whether customers will actually promote us to their friends or virals across as well. Oh, and you will reward them if they do that, right? Uh, yeah, we give free books. Oh, <laughs> so that's how you do it. Okay, but there, you, you want to say something? Yeah, yes, so you want so to add to what she said, right? UX designers would come in to help actually design the journey of the user. So the UX designer in collaboration with other people in the business would, again, look at the existing journey and examine it if there's any error or any pain point from a user standpoint and shape the design of the journey itself. So that goes with, okay, what are we saying, the copy? Um, what do they see in this particular page? Let's say if they came in from Facebook, um, even the design of the ad, we, we help look, take a look at and really watch every step, every step that the user takes within that journey and design accordingly. 
Right. Okay, so a lot of the questions there are very much about acquisition. And one of the questions, few questions below, which, you know, pass, is really about how do you do customer acquisition when you have very low budget? I mean, don't read. Look at me. You have to look at me. It's me, me. I read it already all in my brain now. So now the question is, how do you do customer acquisition? And I think some of the questions they ask, how do you do it at very low budget? What would your advice be? And is giving free stuff the only way to push customers in this region to move? Yeah. Abhishek? I think if you don't have a budget, I, and depending on what platform, if you're an e-commerce platform, for example, right, or an online commerce platform like us, uh, I would invest a lot in SEO. Uh, so that we get, get free traffic coming in, and it's an investment that we make for the future. So I'd invest money more there uh, versus spending a small budget on performance campaign. So an SEO, what would your rough budget, advisable budget be? So it's, uh, so it's, it's the cost is in terms of more people versus dollar value. Okay. So we have a team that works actively on improving our SEO of our platform, which can be done via uh, improving the speed of the platform itself. Like recently made a change in our platform which grew our organic traffic by 50% at no extra cost month on month. So this is 50% extra traffic every month, right? So it's more human cost versus like paid uh, in terms of performance campaign. Okay, so is giving free stuff the only answer or? Okay, not all free stuff works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> all right, I think for, for... Does it not also devalue your product? Actually, not really. Okay. Um, the thing is for us, the reason why we give free is because we want customers to actually use Experience, our Experience, right. Yes, that's actually the biggest thing that um, is actually very important to us. If a customer were to come and create your first book, um, basically, they would love the... Either they would love the user journey, they will love the product, the quality, and they will definitely come back. That's how we retain our customers. Um, my advice to those who say, okay, I don't have a lot of budget, um, you know, I have very, very minimal budget I want to play with. To me, viral marketing is actually the biggest. Um, a question across to everyone here. How many of you use Instagram? Yeah, so that's already one sector. So Instagram is actually one of the biggest way of actually influencing people to buy, right? You, if you don't have the budget, you get your friend to go and viral it on Instagram. Or go find one of your best friends who may be uh, a big time key opinion leaders and things like that. That actually helps. So that actually helps in terms of really starting the ball rolling. It doesn't have to be spending money, right? It can be just say, hey, I want to give you a free pin or I want to give you a free product. Right? And that actually gets the ball rolling already. Have good friends. That's what she's saying. Do, do, you, do you market on uh, Instagram? Yes, we do. So we do a lot of... I've um, never seen you. So oh, I'm you not your target. Oh, not me. You're not Why? my target. <laughs> All right. So we do work with a lot of influencers. Um, <laughs> indirectly, uh, what we do is we actually do a lot of barter trade. So yeah, we give them products, they test, they review it, and they say, hey, it's a really good product to be uh, to use. Um, and that's where it actually really kicks um, things moving. Um, for us, to be very to share with you what happened to us uh, on viral. So we were actually giving out free photo books on our app. Um, someone who was kind enough, um, who we don't know, viral it on Facebook. Uh, and it flew tremendously. So in, a, in somewhere in December 2017, um, photo book app on iOS was number one, trending number one, above WhatsApp, above Facebook, due to viral marketing. Right. Okay, but we have no control to viral something. Yeah. But yeah. I'll give a growth hack. We did, I did for my startup back then. You come to a conference like this, create a Wi-Fi network with the name of your brand. It doesn't cost you anything. Right. right? These hundred, two, few hundred people will actually know about your brand. So no cost. Well, I think that's an interesting point. I, I think if you come to, uh, to 600 participants, okay, for this particular conference and this particular summit, if you didn't make sure all 600 people talk about you when they leave, it's a lost opportunity there. All right, when it comes to UX, let's say I really don't have the budget to continuously do changes to my website. What can I do? I, I, and I need to thank customers, right? So I look at data, perhaps I can't do, what, what do I do with those data? I, I don't have a UX designer. Well, you can be the UX designer. <laughs> so Yourself, right? So f again, at the heart of UX is really getting to know your users, and there are so many ways that you can. So maybe if you don't have the budget, you can go and speak to your users yourselves and ask them, okay, so this is my product, or how do you think can this fit in your lifestyle? Or maybe before 
starting with your product, start with, with them and get to know what their life is like, a day in the life of your user or a day in the life of your consumer. And try to see moments or opportunities that your product can be of value to them. So you can start with that. And those insights that you gather, um, it's hard, right? Because if you cannot design, then if, if you don't have any hands to actually put together the insights that you gathered for the design, then that's going to be a problem with you. So um, again, if you don't have someone to actually design and act on the insights that you've come up with, then that's going to be a problem for you. But in terms of just acquiring the insights, then maybe you can go out and speak to the users yourselves and ask about their lives, a day in the life, and see how your product can come in and be of value. And you can start from there, I guess. Okay, let's go to the bit that is important for our session today. We get to the word incredible and experience. Two things in, in going around that. We'll start with Abhishek. First, how do you measure customer experience? How do you measure that like quantitatively? Number two, how do you create incredible customer experience? The, how, so how we measure uh, customer experience basically is, is he able to do what he wants to do, right? In our case is when he opens the app, can he buy a deal? So that's conversion gives us a sense of whether people can do, uh, how, the conversion, how the experience is like. But experience is actually two types. Uh, one is your UX, which is the experience in the app, and the other is customer experience, which is outside the app. app. What happens once you bought something? You bought a product from one of the e-commerce platform, is it delivered to you on time or not, right? If you have an issue with the product, what is the refund policy? So we, we talk to our customer happiness team also very proactively on a, very, on a weekly basis. You have a customer happiness team? Yes. Okay. And so uh, we talk to them proactively every week to ask them what issues are our customers facing. Let us know. Let me see if we can make it better. So it's a very iterative process that way to get it right. And we've been doing this for the last two years. Right. Every week, every day, we are trying to make the product even better. Right. So that's, that's how we measure. And incredible? What is incredible to you? What would be incredible to you? The same thing, right? If, if I can get a 100% user open the app, get to buy something, it's like, great. Right? Incredible for experience you. for us. For you. No, it's not for us, right? It's, it's actually about the user. UX is all about the user, right? Is he able to do it or not? If he does his job, what he wants, if he can achieve what he wants to achieve, mm. we, we benefit, obviously, since you're a business, right? But that's not, you know, that is how we'll measure. And okay. is it getting better or not? Is our retention getting better or not? Everything. Okay. So UX. Incredible UX. Same as Abhishek. First of all, you have to be able, the design should be able to allow your user to do what the user intended to do. That's number one. And if you can... But shouldn't it be like what you intend, the user intend? Because the intent comes from you first, not so much the user. Okay. Well, it's actually organic. You can look at it that, that, in that lens. Your design, the design of your product, shapes the behavior of the user. At the same time, the user shapes the, the user's behavior, the user's intent, shape the design. So it's a marriage of the two. But it first starts with, if your user comes in, let's say, pick the chart, the first thing that she needs to do is to be able to sign up, actually, um, to use the platform. How easy is the user able to sign up? How many steps does that user take in order to sign up? So not just are, is the user able to accomplish the intended task, but how easy and delightful was the experience, actually. Okay. okay. And Irene, incredible customer experience. Okay. Free book. <laughs> All right, for us, um, getting incredible customer experience actually comes from the customer itself. We actually do a lot of surveys. Mm. Um, we want to know what our customer thinks of either the web, the We app. say a lot. How a many lot. times? We do it we nearly every week. Every week? Yes. We actually do. So we do actually um, do take care of our NPS scores. Um, we want to make sure our customers are happy with us, whether they're happy with the product, whether they're happy with the web, whether they like the user journey, they, whether they like um, you know, the user flow and things like that. So we do keep track of that. And that's actually one of the biggest um, key metrics for us um, to make sure that our customers are always happy. Right? Um, of course, there will be a little bit here and there where customers say, hey, I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like my book, and things like that. But to be very frank, yeah, we cannot satisfy everyone. Right? But I guess overall is to really understand what your customer wants as well. Having a website or having an app, the flow is one thing. Having it look beautiful is one thing. Right? But whether is it user-friendly, whether is it really, really addressing to the needs of a customer, that actually makes what 
a customer experience really works. Okay, the final word to customer is always right. <laughs> customer is always right, but he might not know what he always wants. Yeah. Right. Okay, I agree with that though. <laughs> you can't just do that. I agree with that. <laughs> uh, yes, Maxine. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting statement. Users will tell you what they want. Like for example, in Picture Chart, they keep saying, we want more templates. But you look at the time spent of a user inside Pick the Chart, and we have, what, more than 600 templates. They can't even go past 10. So how, do, how can they know that they want more when they haven't seen the 600 templates, right? So it's not just what your consumers want, but as a, as a designer, you need to perceive, actually, what is the real problem that they're facing, and how can you address that? Nice. Anything so, to add? Yes. Uh, so we use this framework called MAT, which is basically motivation, ability, and trigger. Right? Okay. So it's very important to understand the motivation of the user. Right? What does he want? It not necessarily with us directly. He's not gone. He's not reached there yet. What is his motivation? For us, it's conveniently being able to save money. Right. Right. So that convenience is a key word. Right. So that is where the ability comes in. Can you do what you want to do conveniently? So can the platform let you do it? Right. Trigger points are what ticks you. Is it the rating? Is it the discount percentage? Is it uh, name of the brand? So you have to make sure that is what the user sees first. So we use this framework very actively to find out, start from the user basically. And that leads to doing that like hundreds of times over years, it leads to an incredible customer experience. Okay, thank you very much everyone. Thank you for your participation in Slido. And thank you to each one of you for the wonderful conversation we're having. Pass it back to you. Thank you.